with our community of practice uh, for the youth in peace and security community of practice. And um, we are really excited about the session today. You're in for a treat. Uh, rarely have I heard such promising examples where youth can really have an impact and find solutions um, for problems uh, that can help themselves, can help their communities, uh, can help their countries. So um, it's it's really exciting to uh, to have this webinar. Let me start with a brief background on youth power for those of you who uh, are less familiar with youth power. Um, youth power is a USAID funded project um, that uh, aims to advance solutions that improve young lives. Uh, through integrated research and uh, implementation development programs. It's focused primarily on positive youth development um, with really the stress on the positive. Um, so it sees youth as an opportunity and not uh, as a problem. Uh, the PYD program, programs recognize uh, that uh, youth um, have inherent rights uh, that can result uh, in youth having assets, um, having agency, and being able to contribute to positive change for themselves and their community, which is usually best when they have an enabling environment. So the four aspects of assets, agency, contribution, and enabling environments are the four key components of positive youth development. Uh, and kind of some of the key features underneath that are you know, having role models, having safe spaces, membership, uh, positive expectations. So uh, a really important program. Uh, we will talk at the end just a little bit more about how you can join and contribute in other ways. Uh, but um, uh, for now, let's just uh, have some quick uh, aspects that uh, we want to highlight, which is uh, Youth Power has implementation projects in a variety of countries, countries including El Salvador, Honduras, Kenya, Mozambique, Nicaragua, Eastern Caribbean, and the West Bank, um, and also has evaluation and assessment projects in Nigeria, Zambia, um, in uh, the uh, Latin America region, and uh, a big Program, a big program focus is also on identifying on what works. What works in youth programming that has a positive youth impact. Um, and uh, we've also developed indicators uh, that measure the success of youth programs. Uh, they're just being rolled out uh, on a broader basis. Uh, we've developed a website where you can share resources, events, information. Uh, and then, um, uh, as I said earlier, we have these communities of practice of, with, of which the youth in peace and security is one of them. But we also have three other communities of practice, gender, youth engagement, and cross-sectoral skills. Uh, their focus is on sharing knowledge, sharing information, contributing to um, draft papers, draft assessments, uh, providing input to some of the programs. And uh, we're also launching grants. We have launched four grants last year, and uh, we will launch uh, probably five or six this year. So uh, we hope that uh, you will be able to benefit from some of that and that you will be joining uh, some of the communities of practice. So after this brief introduction of Youth Power, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Theo Zolan. Uh, who is the director of Peace Media and Peace Tech Lab in Africa. Uh, he, um, or Peace Tech Lab, is a separate entity that was uh, created by uh, Yusuf to work at the intersection of technology, media, and data. Thea joined Yusuf in 2008 uh, and has worked with local partners in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Myanmar, and South Sudan, and is currently living in Kenya. Um, he has developed innovative ways to use media in order to help resolve uh, conflicts. He has produced curriculum-based peace media programs and has led efforts to develop tools to limit media incitement to violence, as well as to monitor and counter hate speech. 
prior to joining uh, Yusuf, he has worked at the World Bank Institute, at IREX, and Forrester Research. Fia, thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all, and I hope we can have a conversation afterwards. Um, so, uh, again, my name is Theo Dolan from Peace Tech Lab, and Peace Tech Lab is an independent NGO which uh, recently spun off from the U.S. Institute of Peace. And we work at the intersection of media, technology, and data to help resolve violent conflict around the world. So our vision is centered on four interlinked goals, convene, connect, build, and inspire. For convene, we try to harness the power of cross-discipline and cross-generational collaboration among conflict management professionals, the technology sector, academia, and government. Connect, the lab will be a data hub, having partnerships with social media and big data companies to develop tools for early warning, decision-making, collaboration, and evaluation. Build. Unlike many tech developers, Peace Tech Lab is focused on building solutions for environments where violent conflicts occur, which are often low bandwidth, power deprived, and dangerous. Inspire. Peace Tech Lab will build an industry of peace tech entrepreneurs who innovate and build products that both save lives and invite private sector investment. So by virtue of where we work, which is conflict-affected countries around the world, we're usually working with youth due to simple demographics. Focusing on Africa, where I live, here are some stats on the youth bulge that may not surprise you. The percent of population age 10 to 24 in Burundi and Nigeria is 31%. Um, in Kenya and Tanzania, 32%, and in South Sudan and Somalia, 33%. Even more eye-opening is that the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have the youngest proportion of population in the world, with over 70% of the region's population aged below 30. However, youth in conflict-affected countries in Africa are often struggling for basic services like education and employment, let alone being able to express themselves freely and participate in governance systems. Here are some of the sobering numbers at the global level. Uh, and additionally, youth and children are often tragic victims of conflict. See these numbers of South Sudanese affected by the current conflict. Uh, okay. Yet, African youth also have massive potential, including through their access to ICTs. We strongly believe that youth often just need the knowledge, attitudes, and the tools to take action to resolve conflict. Through the use of media and technology, youth can shift from victims to first responders to peace builders. So we're working to facilitate this shift through what we call peace media. Peace media is essentially behavior change communication for peace building. Key features are that it's curriculum driven, uh, otherwise known as edutainment, which is first and foremost in an entertaining radio drama or reality TV show. Uh, the foundation is, a, is an educational curriculum that seeks to instill in the listening or viewing audience the values and skills needed for conflict resolution. It also addresses very specific conflict drivers. They're different in each conflict context, obviously. The program addresses the root causes of conflict in, in a given environment. And uh, of course, it's youth oriented. Youth are the vast majority of the populations, as, as, as I already noted and youth are, youth are also the next generation leaders and peace builders. Uh, these programs are multimedia, so in addition to the core radio or TV program, we experiment with other technologies like mobile, uh, mobile apps, SMS, social media, to amplify the message and increase, increase youth interaction. Programs are strongly research-based. We carefully measure impact through research that measures listenership and viewership, as well as any changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. And they're also locally produced. So we, we always work with local partners since we understand that they know their audience and their context the best. It's, it's, it's really pretty simple. 
so we, we produce peace media programs in three countries, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. Uh, but I'd like to focus um, on this, in this webinar on South Sudan. Sawa Shabab, or uh, Together Youth, is a 20-episode radio drama in South Sudan targeting young people. Uh, it's produced in English, Arabic, Dinka, and Nuer. It's aired on nearly 30 radio stations throughout the country. Here's a, a broadcast map. Um, as you can see, there are still vast, vast swaths of the country that have no, no access to much media whatsoever, but we, we cover some of the major areas in South Sudan. And the curriculum is designed to inculcate in the youth audience values like coexistence, youth empowerment, and personal responsibility, and gender equality. Um, here are the curriculum goals. And let me just give you an example. Um, so in, in the Sawa Shabab, we have uh, a young character. Her name is Rose. And she has dreams of being an actress. She wants to stay in school in order to do so. But she's being forced into an early marriage to an old guy from her village. And over the course of the drama, she pushes back against this. And uh, to spoil the drama, uh, she's able to get out of the marriage through a community dialogue process uh, by the end of the second season. So that's, that's one example. Um, while radio is the most dominant means of reaching a youth audience in South Sudan, we under also understand that, it, that it's mostly a one-way communication channel. So we work with a, a Nairobi-based company called Frontline SMS to host an ongoing conversation with youth across the country through text messaging and call-ins. For example, at the end of each episode, we script in a question related to the drama and educational goals and ask youth to respond by, by mobile. So youth have responded over the, the three seasons that we've, we've done this program now uh, by the thousands, even though we don't subsidize the, the calls or texts. And we also use various social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to interact with youth who are increasingly online via mobile, even in a, a place like uh, South Sudan. Um, well, it's, it's more of a struggle now, but um, we seek to be as inclusive, inclusive as possible for youth across the country. So whatever, whatever technologies they have access to, we, we, try, we try to use. So what's the impact of this program? Very good question. And the answer is world peace, of course. Uh, OK, uh, that's a joke. But seriously, we conduct carefully designed surveys and focus groups to measure change in knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of the youth audience. We also conduct a phone survey to measure how many young people are listening to the program. We also me measure youth engagement through social media, text messaging, and call-ins. To provide some key metrics of the first season of Sawa Shabab, as I said, we're now into our third season. Um, here are some examples. So we had 62% of the youth had heard of the program. 58% had listened to at least an episode uh, during the first season. 99% wanted to hear the next season. Um, so in terms of youth interaction, we had roughly 10,000 unique calls and texts during the first 20 episode uh, broadcast period with a weekly peak of about 500 calls and texts. Um, given the relatively low mobile penetration, which was 27% roughly, these are exciting results, I think. Um, and now that we're into our third season, we're, we're going to struggle, struggle to, to, meet these, uh, to meet some of these metrics, but um, we'll do the best we can given the environment. So where do we go from here? What we're trying to do is to build youth-led peace-building networks. Peace Tech Lab programs begin by raising awareness and changing attitudes of youth through TV and radio. And then we give youth additional technology tools to take action on the ground. And you'll be hearing from my colleague Derek on another way that, that we do that. Uh, and there's vast potential through media convergence in engaging youth in conflict-affected countries in leading their own community-based peace-building initiatives. So let, let me introduce you to Ben Cheng. He's on the right. Ben Cheng is a university student from the city of Wow in South Sudan. He's a super fan 
of Sal Shabab, who interacts regularly with the radio program via text and social media. Ben Cheng and a small group of other superfans were recently trained in conflict resolution, leadership, project management, and technology tools in order to become what we call youth mobilizers and to lead community-based peacebuilding initiatives like theater, music, and sports. So far, Ben Cheng has met with 600 secondary school students in WOW and has held radio listening groups for local youth to learn about Sao Shabab. He's been given a smartphone to coordinate with different youth groups in implementing local peacebuilding initiatives. And actually, we, we've been able to, uh, last year, built around the second season, we were able to link him with uh, youth mobilizers in two other cities. And uh, collectively, they reached uh, 8,000 community members with some of the local initiatives that they were undertaking. Uh, and again, these are simple uh, community-driven, youth-led uh, peace-building initiatives that are related to the, the radio drama. So this is just one example from our pilot youth mobilization program, but greater impact is really just a question of scale. And this is where the private sector can help provide relatively low-cost assistance to help foster significant gains in local communities. For example, mobile providers like Zane and Vivicel in South Sudan are quite active in working with humanitarian NGOs during the current and, and ongoing conflict. We've also been discussing how they can subsidize calls and texts for and provide SMS short codes for youth to interact more easily with Sao Shabab. The more youth are included in the conversation about building peace, the more they can help create change. So one example of, of uh, this, this is just a screenshot of, of our frontline SMS system and, and uh, shows examples of some of the engagement that we've had uh, through, through SMS uh, over the course of now three seasons of the program. Um, one example of how effective this private sector ICT investment in peace building uh, can be is seen with uh, Sisi Niamani, uh, where I live in Kenya. Sisi Niamani basically means we are peace. And uh, during the 2013 election period, Safaricom, which is the largest mobile provider in Kenya, donated 50 million text messages to enable Sisi Niamani um, to interact with 65,000 subscribers through their mobile platform in order to collect information on potential conflict in high-risk areas and send out messages to counter misinformation and diffuse tension. So efforts like Sisi Niamani's were accredited with being highly effective in preventing election violence during that election period. So in closing, I'd just like to emphasize that supporting tech-savvy youth as peace builders is a critical investment across public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Not only are youth the next generation of leaders, but they're also the current generation of technology consumers and local peace builders. So I'd like to leave you with this uh, quotation in just to close, young people are not just decision takers, they are, can be decision makers too. And the, my contact information is there. Uh, feel free to follow up. And uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague Derek. Thank you, Thea. This was really exciting. And uh, I can imagine that we'll have quite a few questions at the end. Uh, but we won't. I will go directly to Derek, and then we'll have questions at the end. If you have any questions that come up during uh, the presentation and you don't want to forget it, you can also type it into the chat, and we will uh, read it at the end. Or uh, you can raise your hand at the end, and uh, we will uh, give you the microphone. Um, so with that, let me uh, move to uh, Derek. Derek is a senior specialist at the Peace Tech Lab and an independent games developer. You have to tell us more about that, too. Well. Um, he works uh, to connect peace builders with technology and processes. Um, and uh, he's administrating the Peace Tech Exchange program that he's going to tell us more about. He's linking civil society organizations, activists, and governments to low-cost, easy-to-use tools in conflict areas like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And he advises peace games projects and seeks to build a community around impact gaming. So Derek, please take it away. Well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, 
as, as you mentioned, uh, I work at the Peace Tech Lab on a program called Peace Tech Exchanges. And it's through the Peace Tech Exchanges that I came by the story that I want to convey today, uh, which is a personal inspiration to me about how youth with access to low cost, easy to use technology can really uh, implement change in the world. Um, little overview of the Peace Tech Exchanges, uh, they're the lab's workshop series where we go into conflict zones and connect peace builders, whether they be nonprofits, youth activists, members of local government, journalists, what have you, with tools and uh, connections with technologists to become more effective in achieving their peace building objectives. Um, we've done this in quite a few places. Uh, since 2013, we've done peace tech exchanges in, uh, I guess, 10 countries now, 17 different events. Uh, and we've tried to address peace uh, through a variety of lenses from countering violent extremism to preventing gender-based violence to improving transparency and accountability. Um, the workshops themselves, uh, very briefly, are in kind of an unconference style where rather than having a sort of passive learning session, we try to make uh, participants actively uh, in charge of the structure of the events. We let them choose the technologies that they want to learn more about, um, the discussions that they want to have around technology, and ultimately the projects that they want to carry out. Um, now, it's through the, the Peace Tech Exchanges, or I, I, I should say that like the Peace Tech Exchanges themselves are, are based off this fundamental theory that if you have low cost, easy to use technology in the hands of change makers or peace builders, then they can really change the world um, as long as the tools are integrated into, into their workflow appropriately. We don't believe the technology itself is the solution. We think that it's a tool and a resource for people who already have peace building solutions. So uh, the story I wanted to tell comes out of the Peace Tech Exchange uh, that we carried out in Mumbai, India back in 2014. Um, wow, two years ago. Uh, the uh, Peace Tech Exchange in Mumbai was around uh, countering gender-based uh, violence. And if you don't know, um, Mumbai is home to one of the largest slums in the world. It's called Dharavi. Uh, anywhere between 700,000 and a million people uh, live in this unauthorized housing community. It's one of the largest in the world. And the people living in this community um, have a whole bunch of challenges to living their, their daily lives. Lack of access to electricity, regular access to water, sanitation, um, in many cases, the internet. Uh, and yet, uh, the Dharavi slums is home to uh, a lot of innovation and a lot of entrepreneurs trying to change the world and make things very different. Now, four of those young uh, change makers ended up attending uh, the Peace Tech Exchange, and they were young women, girls at the time, actually, uh, between 11 and 12. And they kind of stood out uh, from the rest of the, the crowd. Usually at Peace Tech Exchanges, we have two different types of people. We have peace builders who aren't necessarily uh, technologists, they're experts in their field, but are learning about tools and technologies that they can integrate into their work. And then we have the technologists, the trainers who are experts in technology, but don't necessarily have the, the skill sets or the, the focus on peace building. The girls themselves were kind of the, the Venn diagram overlapping of the two uh, groups who, um, you know, at the age of 11 and 12, were trying to address sexual harassment and uh, violence against themselves and their mothers uh, in the Dharavi community. Uh, and the way that they were doing it was through an app uh, called Women Fight Back. It was in prototype stage at the time the Peace Tech Exchange was going on. And this app is actually pretty in incredible. Um, with the push of a button, you can generate a uh, uh, panic noise so that people know that something's going on. Uh, the app can even do complex things like pulling from the phone's GPS location and then sending that via SMS to uh, people like an emergency list of contacts. Right? What's so impressive about this app, aside from the fact that it's made by 12-year-olds in an area where regular access to the internet and electricity is not uh, particularly common, is that it was done for free using an application called 
uh, MIT App Inventor. And this is an online utility uh, generated by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and it's free. It helps people to generate Android applications. What I think is so cool about this uh, particular service is unlike all the other online app creation utilities that you can find online like Appify or Ionic uh, Creator, uh, MIT App Inventor is free and it, and it teaches somebody how to code. So um, what you're seeing here is a, a window of uh, a, the, the code background to an MIT uh, App Inventor app. It basically takes uh, complex lines of code and abstracts them into kind of puzzle piece shapes that interlock with each other in a way that's approachable, but nevertheless kind of mirrors the way uh, that coding languages normally work. And the girls have been using, using this application uh, not only to learn how to code, but to address um, this problem of sexual harassment in their own community. Um, it wasn't just sexual harassment. I could go on and on about the, the various other uh, applications that these young women, uh, at the time all between the ages of 11 and 13, were addressing. Um, they were teaching, they created apps to uh, teach uh, users how to learn a new technology, or uh, I'm sorry, a new language. Um, there's a well in their community that usually people are standing in hours, uh, hours in line to access, and the girls developed this digital queuing system. These are all different uh, problems that they managed to tackle on their own with, you know, maybe some uh, mentorship support, but in really incredibly challenging circumstances. And for me, that's incredible, seeing what kind of work people are able to accomplish with the help of some free uh, access to technology. So um, the lab's role in all of this, after bringing to the, the girls to the Peace Tech Exchange, we help them to develop their app and to, from the prototype into the, the final stages um, and help them get it published on Google Play where it's now available uh, and much more easily accessible for people in their community. Um, and the girls have gone on to use a variety of other low-cost, easy-to-use tools. So Generosity by Indiegogo is, um, well, a crowdfunding uh, tool that is accessible by uh, nonprofits. It kind of removes the platform tax for, for using this crowdfunding tool. Uh, and they used it to gather money to get uh, network fire sensors. Um, these are fire sensors uh, that are like traditional fire alarms, but are particularly valuable for people in um, uh, like unauthorized uh, slum communities uh, because of a certain way that they're constructed. Uh, here's a picture of their crowdfunding page where they actually ended up raising um, 16, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, $11,000 out of their $10,000 goal. Uh, so 116% of, of uh, what they were hoping to accomplish. And, you know, this is just one example amongst the many that at the lab we encounter uh, all the time. Um, there's a group of um, people in Iraq that we've been helping to uh, use Kobo Toolbox, a free data collection tool that works in low connectivity environments. Um, they've collected information about uh, refugees and people displaced by violent conflict. There's uh, applications like Storymaker, which uh, run on Android devices. They're free, and they teach people how to tell a story using video, which is one of the most compelling mediums that you can have. Uh, the, the group that ended up using Storymaker uh, with funding from the Peace Tech Exchanges um, did a mini documentary on the medical conditions faced by refugees and helped like, present this documentary to local government in order to, to drive aid. Um, and really, these tools are amongst the slew of tools that are available for others to use. So uh, in, in closing, I guess I'd say like, technology isn't the, the solution, but if you have young people who are driven and are already trying to accomplish great works, technology can be integrated into their processes to help them get that extra mile and help them to accomplish their objectives. Fabulous. Thank you, Derek. Uh, these are very encouraging stories. Uh, we're now going to open up uh, to questions from our audience. We have a few questions uh, in our chat while everybody uh, can get ready on the, uh, on the raising by raising their hand. Um, so uh, 
let me start perhaps uh, with one of the questions um, which uh, was posted here. Uh, I see, I know you mentioned that um, there is, that you are measuring kind of how much people are participating in the program. And I think one of the questions here is how or are you or how are you measuring kind of the impact on peace building? Um, what effect it has uh, in the community or uh, from kind of more peace building effort and changing behaviors? Uh, should we take that now? Yeah. Um, right. So it's a great question, and it's, it's always the struggle for uh, peace building programs is is to measure impact because uh, we're not we're not uh, in public health where uh, impacts are very measurable. Either the malaria rate drops, or the HIV AIDS rate drops, or it doesn't. Um, we're in a space where um, it's it's very difficult to measure impacts. So that said, I think uh, related to Sa Sawa Shabab in South Sudan. Um, we have three different ways of, of gathering data and attempting to measure impact. We have uh, the listenership of the program. Are youth listening? Uh, do they like the program? Uh, are they relating to the characters? Um, also, um, on the knowledge, attitude, and behavior change front, uh, how are they responding to the educational goals of the program? Um, are, they, uh, are they learning uh, more about uh, gender equality and how that might play out differently in their communities? Are they uh, responding to the messages of national unity, um, which is very difficult in, in any conflict context, but, but particularly right now in South Sudan. Um, so we do baseline and endline surveys and focus groups to try to, to measure that type of, of, um, of change. And then additionally, through the SMS and social media interaction, we're able to gather more qualitative data on, on uh, what, what the youth find uh, are most important and, and what they're willing to do. Uh, it's, it's the behavior change piece that's really the most elusive, um, of course, and it takes uh, multiple seasons of this type of programming with, with frequency and repetition to really get at uh, more of a longitudinal view of, of how you're creating impact. So it, it's a process, and I think, I think that, that's, uh, that's true for a lot of organizations working on, on peace and security issues. Thank you. I think we have a raised hand uh, by Noah. So Noah, you have the microphone. And you need to click on the green microphone at the top of your screen uh, once when you want to speak. No, I think you have the microphone. We can't hear you, Noah. Ah, now we can hear you a little bit, but can you speak up a little more? We've heard a little bit. Of it. Uh, we'll come back to you, Noah. Um, there must be some. There may be something with your microphone that we can't hear you. Perhaps you can get closer to your microphone. But um, any other um, questions on the? No, what you can do is if you can't, since we can't hear you, you can type your question uh, into the chat area and then uh, we can uh, answer your question. Um, in the meantime, um, we also have Val Hogan here and I think Valerie, you have uh, posted a few questions here. Do you want to just uh, mention them? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Theo, for um, addressing the question about impact. Um, I, I think actually 
more of what you're describing is is short short term outcomes and in some cases outputs. And I, I would I would propose that um, there there are actually ways to get more at the impact of, of your interventions and I think that depends more on how we frame what we're looking for in terms of change. Um, you're talking about more the individual level of change, but I think that um, you could also be polling um, the, the people who are participating in your work about um, actual observances that they've seen of how conflict has either been avoided, mitigated, um, resolved, even transformed. Um, and yeah, it may just be based on um, individuals' opinions, but I, I think that you could start um, collecting data on, on that actual um, effect on, on conflict itself. It, it, is, it is harder to define peace building, but I think, I think, I think when, when people are engaged in or potentially engaged in some type of conflict event, um, I think they can collect data on that, on, on, on those events, and, and start to to build up a repository of how you might um, demonstrate that you are contributing to building of a positive peace. Um, so I'd just like your yours and Derek's response to that, if possible. Yeah, uh, noted and acknowledged. Um, I mean. First off, there's the question of, of budget. Uh, research budgets are limited, and and that, uh, especially in complex contexts like uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, where we work, it's very difficult to get research of any kind, and it's yeah. it's always costly. So yeah. we have limitations on that front. But mm -hmm. but to your point, I I, I think that's that's exactly right. Um, but uh, the struggle is always uh, how to connect. Um, local conflict resolution efforts with the impact of our program. And making that direct connection is often very difficult. So we have to rely on on, uh, on, on other ways to, to measure that type of impact. But uh, that said, when we do our outreach programming, which is the example of Benchang that I offered, um, with local youth leading peace building efforts, that's where we can get at that. Mm -hmm. and, and so on that front, we've done some social network analysis uh, in terms of how the youth are interacting with others? Have they built trust uh, in their communities uh, based on the the outreach activities that they've led, and and that's where we can start getting at that. So uh, again, it's 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 often a just just a funding issue. Thank you. Great. I see that uh, Rama has raised his hand. We're giving you the microphone, and uh, you need to click on the microphone in the upper kind of middle left hand corner. Um, hello. hello, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Theo. And I wanted to say that I'm really, really amazed by these incredible initiatives. Uh, I've been reading uh, meanwhile about Sawa Shabab and uh, Women Fight Back applications. And I had the question, about the sustainability models that you have in place. This is the um, first question. And second question is, uh, did you think of building an online academy to share the knowledge that you are uh, trying uh, in peace building and uh, negotiation? Uh, thanks for that question. Are, are we live? Can I speak? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that question, Rafa. Um, as far as sustainability, I think the lab <laughs> uh, encounters the same challenges as the rest of our colleagues in this field. Where we try to make things sustainable in the peace tech exchanges um, is to uh, make it so that after the exchanges are gone, people still have the increased capacity to use technology and can continue to carry out their projects. And to the extent that we can measure that with follow-up surveys, either three or six months after our initial workshops are done, uh, we, we do our best. Yes, we do try to have online resources um, for our participants. Uh, one of the pilot initiatives that we've just launched 
is called uh, the Peace Tech Wiki, which you all can see if you want. Uh, it's at peacetech.wiki online. Uh, and it's our attempt to connect people to post-event resources so they can learn more about data collection tools and which ones apply for their particular circumstances or um, data visualization or um, the various other like game design um, things that we bring to uh, Peace Tech Exchange courses. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention uh, our recent attempts to partner with education uh, programs and education institutions in order to um, increase build, peace building learning. So, um, uh, and OSRX, indeed. Um, with, in, on the, the university partnerships front, the lab is joining with Drexel College of Engineering uh, based in Philadelphia, and we've launched an online uh, course around peace engineering. Um, which helps engineers develop uh, conflict uh, resolution and management skills. Um, and we've been slowly developing and growing it over the past uh, year or so, uh, about to finish, I think, our first or our second major course. Uh, and then, as Theo points out, uh, OSRX uh, is one of the programs that didn't get discussed uh, today, which is um, the lab's initiative to help peace builders um, use data more effectively. Um, the, the full name for the program is the Open Situation Room Exchange. Our version 1.0 is available um, right now uh, on osrx.org. And over time, we're going to be building out a, a website to help peace builders in given environments uh, develop data sets that can better understand their own conflict environment, how their work uh, intersects with the broader uh, conflict indicators uh, in their society um, and ultimately we hope uh, help people make better database decisions. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions that also came in through the chat. Um, one of them is during the Arab Spring while social media was used and seen as a liberating means to speak truth to power now the issue is how to speak truth to social media. Many a times it is a challenge to distinguish between fact and fiction. How do we deal with this challenge to better educate the youth towards a decision-making process that allows for factual decision-making processes versus emotionally driven fiction decision-making processes and biases? Very valid question. Yeah. Um. I would not consider myself uh, a social media expert, but I would say that any sort of learning program that we would have around youth would have to be something that's done in person uh, and something that uh, sets youth, um, like works with youth to do the sort of behaviors that we're hoping to accomplish. Social media is this cacophonous, um, massive uh, conversation where a million things are happening at once. And uh, while it's possible to have driven social media campaigns around a particular issue, I think um, direct interpersonal relationships are some of the most powerful ways that we can shape behaviors. Um, so any programming would have to be a, a direct personal relationship, in my opinion. Yeah, I just add that, that media literacy and information verification are two keys to, to the work that we do. Um, we are currently doing some research uh, focused on online hate speech as it relates mm -hmm. to the conflict in South Sudan. And I think this is, this is a, a, an area which, which needs a lot more exploration and, and research behind it. But what we've done is we've created a, a lexicon of online uh, hate speech terminology that's used. Uh, and we, we did this through a survey of 100 South Sudanese asking them what they consider to be mm -hmm. online hate speech. And then we've built uh, contextual descriptions of how these terms are used in, in a hateful way uh, to help raise awareness about the danger of, this, of online hate speech and help to better inform organizations and individuals monitoring and countering hate speech. So I think that speaks to your point. And, and, and um, through various dialogues that we've had around this research, it's, it's very clear that um, there are a lot of different dynamics in terms of, of, of how uh, people buy in to uh, and, and believe uh, what they see on social media, uh, how they are able to respond to it, and uh, just at the level of, of trauma that, that's involved with, uh, with, with social media uh, impacting um, 
uh, traumatized uh, ma mainly youth populations. So um, it, it's, it's wrapped into a whole host of issues, uh, but our research is just attempting to get at uh, a small part of, of aiding in, in media literacy. Great, thank you. Um, another question has come in that is asking, is any of the panelists aware uh, or has been part of a similar work in Syria? Um, well, I, I pointed to one one source I know in, in uh, it's called Syria Deeply. Uh, it's it's kind of a, a, a news sharing uh, and, and technology source that's run by a former ABC News person who specializes in Syria. But I'm not super tapped in on the Syria front. Maybe Derek has a couple of examples. I think Syria Deeply is a good example. I'm not sure I have any more. Okay. Um. There's also a comment from Amy Williams uh, about, I think, the online um, activities. It's a huge issue, online hate speech and slut shaming online for girls and young women globally. So uh, a lot of uh, kind of agreement also among the participants uh, about this issue, which is not just in developing countries, but even in the US, a big issue. Sure. Um, any other, do we have any questions uh, on the, from the audience? Um, Nazir, is Nazir uh, raising his hand or not? Okay. We do have a question from Twitter, from the Beanstech Lab. They say, you are not just the next generation, they are current consumers of technology. How can we leverage for peace building? <laughs> um, well, thanks, guys. Good to, good to know you're listening. And you're, and you're, and you're fired. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the one mechanism that we employ, employ through the Peace Tech Exchanges, um, I think, is, is, is one worth seeing, which is, um, you know, it, I didn't go into too much detail around this uh, in the Peace Tech Exchanges, but... Um, we have a micro grants program attached to our workshops where people who come with ideas are able to uh, launch initiatives, even if it's you know with increments uh, between like five hundred and five thousand dollars, in order to get something off the ground to try a new initiative to demonstrate a proof of concept, which they can then go on and get more funding for. And we've been able to see some um, success in this uh, through like the the micro grants program. Uh, in Pakistan, for example, we're running a program on countering violent extremism. And uh, one of the first groups that we funded was from Lahore. Uh, we funded a group called From Apathy to Empathy, uh, or FATE, as their, their acronym is, is called, um, to create a game for empathy building. Um, in Lahore, uh, there are a bunch of different uh, breakdowns, um, socioeconomic, ethnic, religious, uh, and this group works um, in, uh, of young peace builders, works in local uh, university classrooms and high schools to try to teach people to empathize with people from the other group, whether it's from another ethnicity or another religious group. What we ended up funding them to do was to develop uh, a game prototype. Um, if you've ever played SimCity, uh, it's uh, a, a, a game where you have to build up a city and balance all these different economic and, and political forces in order to have a, a thriving society. Uh, this team basically made a shift on the, the SimCity idea where you also had to make sure that resources were evenly distributed uh, amongst different groups in your community so that everybody's happy. Um, and in order to succeed, you needed to demonstrate the sort of empathetic behavior uh, that you wouldn't ordinarily think about. And uh, this group has, you know, done some fantastic work. Uh, they've gotten some some great attention, and we're happy to provide them with a, a increment of follow-on funding um, because, you know, this is the sort of thing that youth are creatively able to accomplish, uh, just given a little bit of resources and a little bit of trust in their abilities. Great. Um, one of the questions from Mohammed is, "What are you doing to mobilize youth in Pakistan?" <laughs> um, hi, Mohammed. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, so in addition to the FATE program, which I just talked about, we have another, uh, a couple of other initiatives. Um, there's one group that is uh, seeking in Karachi to mobilize a network of mentors to at-risk uh, youth in uh, their, their communities. Uh, it, it's called Mentub. Uh, there's another one uh, called Karachi Binale, which mobilizes both uh, youth and um, non-youth uh, artists and change makers by mapping the different art, arts uh, institutes around the city and, and highlighting to people what sort of a diverse community they have. Um, we funded a young group of developers to uh, create a travel uh, app in uh, some of the more uh, traveled areas of Pakistan where tourists and local uh, religious communities are clashing. Uh, the app is there as an educational resources to like tourist communities so they better understand and are able to respect the institutions that they're viewing. Um, uh, we're helping people use uh, a tool called EngageSpark, which you haven't heard about it, I'd, I'd recommend checking out, which allows um, people, even with just a very small amount of resources, to send uh, mass SMS and IVR messages and collect information uh, from a broad variety of people. And these folks are, are using it to gather information about, um, say, for example, orphans in their target communities in Karachi. So. Uh, there's a variety of things that uh, we're doing in Pakistan and hopefully going to continue to do over the next couple of years. Great. Thank you, Derek. Um, I have a question for Theo for the communications programs. How long do you usually uh, see that it takes for one of these series to really take hold and, and you know, show some kind of impact? So if everyone's uh, likely familiar with Sesame Street, which is uh, a, a children's uh, very popular form of, of edutainment, and it's kind of the gold standard for behavior change communications. And for Sesame Street, it usually takes uh, you know several uh, years, several seasons of uh, consistent watching in order to to begin to change attitudes and behaviors. It's uh, so, so again, it requires frequency and repetition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we'll have four seasons of Sawa Shabab. And uh, at that point, I think we'll be able to have a more uh, long-term longitudinal mm -hmm. view of, mm -hmm. of uh, the potential impact. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And uh, we will give, the, give you the microphone. Uh, I know one of the questions has also come in about indicators and how we or how we are measuring uh, you know some of these programs. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, youth power learning has developed some indicators that are being rolled out now. Um, we will share those with all the listeners. Uh, we will set up a page and send you all the link uh, with the recording of this of this uh, presentation. And we'll also put in some of the answers and, and uh, links to useful resources that have been mentioned on the call, among others. We will send you the link to uh, information about the indicators. I think we have another question here from Valerie. Um, thanks. Um, so, Theo and Derek, I'm really curious about, um, and, and probably particularly in South Sudan, where, where there is so much internal displacement. Um, I would think that young people's link to um, to you all um, actually is kind of a lifeline, um, and, and I just wondered if you could talk about that. Um, just just being able to have contact with um, with others when when you're in a very um, contentious situation where where there's active conflict or or where you're actually fleeing. Um, it, do you have any comments on that? Well, actually, the, the uh, examples that I'm thinking of come from our uh, Iraq uh, TV show. Uh, we did four years of a reality, peace building reality TV show in Iraq, and that ran from 2009 to 2013. And so at that, that point when it ended, the uh, U.S. government pulled out the troops and a lot of the funding for programs like this also went away. 
Um, and then, of course, ISIS invaded. And, and um, we, we, we've seen that a lot of the youth that participated on the TV show uh, have actually been uh, really positively impacted by their participation on the program. And and uh, and so they've not only been survivors, but they've completed university programs, uh, sometimes in conflict-affected areas, uh, and they've become lawyers and doctors and artists and and so on. And additionally, uh, helped uh, raise money for IDP campaigns. They've led peace marches. Um, they've really been active. So um, obviously, we can't we can't take total credit for that. But but I'd like to think we have a small. Uh, impact on on how these youth have have gone about uh, you know their their lives uh, at a very very human very basic mm -hmm. level um, and and that's that's kind of what we're we're looking for on a broader scale these are the the TV show participants themselves right. with another question from Rama how did you manage to build partnerships and corporations with local organizations uh, I can talk about what we do in the Peace Tech Exchange program. Um, there's a couple different types of partnerships that we have when we're operating in the field. Um, the most important partner is our uh, primary local partner who helps us put on these events. Um, at the lab, we feel strongly that if these projects that we work on are going to be successful, they need to be locally driven. And so we put uh, a local partner in the driver's seat for every single uh, Peace Tech exchange that we do. We provide the model, uh, the basic idea of how these uh, exchanges are operated, and then work with the local uh, partner that we find to adapt and shape it according to the local context. Um, usually we find this, this local partner as um, a peace building expert or a technology expert and Ideally, some, some mix of, of the two. Uh, and then, you know, the second type of uh, partnerships and relationships that we have are with the organizations that we end up uh, providing technical and monetary support to through the, um, the grants pro program. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of research on local peace building organizations and uh, invite uh, people to attend our events. Uh, and once they attend and come up with a project idea, we have a uh, a, a period of, of um, something that's kind of like the TV show Shark Tank, uh, where we have them pitch their ideas to a panel of uh, local and international uh, peace building judges. Um, and the people who uh, uh, end up winning the uh, Shark Tank style uh, pitch sessions end up getting the, uh, the prizes. And then after, uh, after that period of um, like actual funding, we provide some sort of technical support, whether it's guidance on how to use a tool or, um, you know, tutorials on how to publish an app on, on Google Play. So there are a number of different relationships and usually they involve uh, putting the, the local partner in the driver's seat and then supporting in whatever way that we can. Wonderful. Well, I think we're uh, reaching the end um, and so I think this is actually a very good way of, uh, of ending our discussion. Uh, we will still be available on Twitter for a little while if anybody has any additional questions that you want to ask I will keep the chat room open for a little bit longer if you have any additional questions that come to mind that you haven't yet had a chance to ask and uh, we will try to answer it. Um, in terms of what you can do next, um, Obviously, I think both Derek and Thea left the door open for uh, you to reach out to them uh, if you have any additional questions for resources or, uh, or additional um, uh, questions you want to ask them. Um, if uh, with regard to youth power, uh, you know, we also want to encourage you, if you are not yet a member of our community of practice, to please join the community of practice and also visit our learning hub for youth power uh, at youthpower.org. There is a lot of resources, best practices, what works, and other knowledge and information that can be useful. Um, we also encourage contributions like a blog. So if ever you are inspired and want to write a blog or send us some other stories, uh, please do so. And uh, we are always very, very uh, interested in having contributions uh, from the field, from youth, from youth-led organizations, implementers, um, 
and others. So uh, thank you for joining the call. Thank you, Derek and Theo, for uh, giving this wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you for everybody. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.